Well, hello and welcome everyone to this fourth and final installment of the Cambridge University Institute for Sustainability Leadership's summer research webinar. I'm very delighted to say that today we are going to be uh, learning about Caroline Lee and Catherine Hammond's work about the role of supermarkets in supporting local community well-being. Their work forms part of the of CSR's Prince of Wales Global Sustainability Fellowship Programme, which was launched about three years ago to allow for impact for challenge-led and well challenge-driven and impact-led research work to um, look at actually to real-world challenges that companies, businesses, finance and policy leaders are facing. So their work is designed to inform those decision makers to take information and well robust information back into their organization, organizations and inform future decisions that in this case supermarkets can make in supporting local communities. I'm very delighted to introduce to you Catherine and Caroline. So Caroline Lee is a Prince of Wales Fellow in, in, in Community Wellbeing at CSL and a Senior Research Associate at Cambridge Public Health. She has over 20 years of experience in, in applied research through a public and mental health lens. She has also worked in both academia and consultancy sectors, all but always with a focus on addressing inequalities. In particular, Caroline specializes in evaluating policies and interventions for employment in different settings. Dr. Catherine Hammond is a research associate at CSL with a background in community-led regeneration, particularly in market towns. And she's also a chartered surveyor working in commercial property and towards understanding power dynamics in communities. Their work is supported by a philanthropic gift from a major supermarket or, well, retailer, in this case from a philanthropic donation from ASDA to the University of Cambridge. And I know there are some of our ASDA colleagues out on the call today as well, so just also want to take this opportunity to thank ASDA for their generosity in making this work possible. The combined work of this fellowship focuses on the relationship between supermarket stores and the people, places and public services around them. Caroline and Catherine are invest investigating the impact of current community-oriented activities by food re retailers on community well-being. In particular, their impact in more disadvantaged parts of the UK and the potential to create more impactful future interventions. So I'm not going to talk much further. I'll be, I'll be about to hand over to Catherine and Caroline to talk us through their absolutely fantastic work that they've been doing with us for over two years now. Before I hand over though, just a quick uh, quick note in terms of housekeeping. I know a lot of you joined us from different platforms, some through GoTo, some through LinkedIn. However, in both scenarios, you do have the option to um, submit questions to us, which we will be fielding at the end of the presentation or rather towards the end of the webinar. Like I said, without much further ado, I'll hand over to Catherine and Caroline. Take it away. Thank you, Jana, and hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, Catherine and I are really pleased to have the opportunity to present a flavour of the work that we've been doing, exploring the potential of supermarkets to leverage their resources and their everyday positioning to support local communities around a store. Before we start, I'd like to extend my thanks to all the people who've taken part in the conversations for the research, from people working in local authorities and in the voluntary and community sector across the country, and particular colleague, particularly colleagues at ASDA and the co-op, both of those working in communities on the front line and also those in head office, um, many of whom have given up their time on more than one occasion in the last couple of years. The enthusiasm for what they do and openness to reflect on and share their experiences has been phenomenal. And you'll see several photographs of community colleagues from, from stores in their role out in the community scattered throughout the presentation and hopefully that'll help to illustrate some of the things that we've that we're talking about at the same time i do want to stress that this is an independent study um, and it's seeking to provide insights on the supermarket sector and community interactions as a whole and, and indeed perhaps beyond that for other businesses that are also anchored in communities we're going to begin with the rationale for looking at this area of work and discuss the stages of the study how we've gone about it We'll go on to highlight the nature of existing social purpose programmes, what they look like on the ground. And then we'll go on to briefly talk about how we're attempting, attempting to unpick the impact of those, the process and the outcomes resulting from those actions, as well as the potential for greater effectiveness and added value going forward. 
and we'll finish briefly on the next steps for the study and beyond. So starting with the rationale, why did, why did we think this is something interesting to look into? Um, well, for my part, the study has its foundations in, in, in concerns for the enduring inequalities across the UK, illustrated clearly in the dramatic slowing of improvements, for example, in life expectancy in recent years, with those living in deprived communities in England spending a greater proportion of their lives in poor health. The map image on the left of the screen here is from the Health Foundation, and this indicates in the deeper blue those local authorities where people live vastly fewer years in good health than those in the lighter shading. And our research begins from a standpoint that, in, that inequities result from what are termed the wider determinants of health, the unequal social, material, political conditions in which people are born, live, work and age, which affect their access to play, recreation, education, decent employment, housing and support services influencing health and well-being throughout life. And this was really laid bare recently in the differential experiences and health outcomes observed during the COVID-19 pandemic. The diagram on the right here um, highlights the main categories of determinants of people's health and well-being, with the wider determinants, sometimes called stru structural determinants, like access to power, good education and employment, and their associated influence on psychosocial factors such as self-esteem and purpose in life being at least as important as health behaviours such as smoking and alcohol consumption. Reflecting this acknowledgement of the key influence of wider determinants, there's been increasing emphasis in recent UK policy on the role of place-based strategies and community-centred approaches to intervening in ways that respond to specific features of context as a means to improving health outcomes and reducing health inequalities. Such place or community-centred perspectives often talk about an asset-based approach, and these seek to understand and identify the role of local resources or assets and their activation or mobilisation in favour of improving population wellbeing. These assets can be direct actions and formal services, infrastructure around organisations such as partnerships and networks of support between people in a community, the built environment and community spaces, community knowledge and insights, and human resources like staff and volunteers. And key to asset-based approaches is using these skills, capacities and the local environment to develop solutions to local challenges with levels of community well-being determined by the balance between resources available to communities and the challenges or exposures they face. So research and assessment of the impact of community-centred and asset-based approaches, however, has been almost entirely focused on the statutory and third sectors. And we, but we argue that the application of an asset-based lens is equally a useful way to view the potential of business more strategically as contributors to the well-being of their catchment communities. The status of supermarkets in particular as a linchpin in communities was highlighted in the response to the pandemic, whether that, by, whether that be by securing supply of essential food and medicines to residents, to rare opportunities for social interaction as essential everyday spaces, to some companies engaging widely with mass, the mass vaccination campaigns. So a question worth asking, we think then, is could we be looking towards the anchor positioning of supermarkets as an opportunity to intervene for the well-being of local residents. And now Catherine's going to talk in a bit more depth about how we've gone about investigating this question and what kinds of actions and activities by supermarkets could perhaps be considered as part of an asset-based approach to community well-being. Catherine, have you got the, are you able to talk? Oh, I, I am talking. <laughs> I think you must have been on mute. Okay, well, I'll start again. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank you. Now. All right, good, good, good. Um, so turning now to the question of how we know what the supermarkets are doing in terms of their support for local communities, I'm going to run through an overview of the research process and our general approach to collecting the data. Here you can see a picture um, of some of the COP uh, member pioneers out and about. 
Great, so now we're turning to uh, the diagram which captures the principal stages of the research and gives you a flavour of the many diverse ways in which we've engaged with local communities. So there are four main phases, starting with um, our desktop analysis, uh, where we first looked across the global literature to scope out the existing academic research on the topic. And then we examined the corporate social responsibility or CSR literature that was publicly available from the UK's major supermarkets, specifically with the intention to identify activity supporting local communities. From that, we created a typology of activity, which I'll talk about in more detail in a moment. Both of these pieces have been written up as papers and we'll give you the link to them at the end of the presentation. We then moved into the data collection phase which started by us holding one-to-one -one in depth phone interviews with 10 community champions from Asta stores across the country, from Southampton to Elgin, and with 13 member pioneers and member pioneer coordinators at the co-op from Boston to Stockport. We talked about how they identified their community, what are its strengths and assets, as well as its challenges and priorities. We then discussed the ways that they engaged with the community and local organisations. Finally, we explored the types of activity they saw making a difference and what the impact of that was. Having gathered this information, we also scoped the growing literature on community well-being and the various indices used to identify communities of need. Some of this thinking is captured in a working paper Caroline has written, which is being published by CISL shortly, details again at the end. All of this information, the insights from the community colleagues and the wellbeing indices help to identify the main case study locations, as well as shaping the data collection. There were four main case study sites for this particular place-based research, Leeds, Warrington, Wisbeach and Blantyre. And then more recently, our colleague, Dr. Marina Buswell, who in the course of her investigation, looking specifically at supermarkets and older adults, uncovered some innovative practice in Thurrock. Finally, you'll see that there is an additional community research project or peer research element at the bottom of the diagram, which has been run in Leeds and Wisbeach. And Caroline will talk about this aspect in more detail later. You'll also see that in addition to the interviews and case studies, we extended the reach of the research by gathering information through online surveys of various sorts. We're now firmly into the validation phase which has taken the information gathered in the data collection phase and identified themes and propositions which we fed back to the community colleagues from ASDA and the co-op to see whether they agree with these preliminary findings. We're also going to be holding stakeholder discussions with a view to firming up our thoughts and recommendations. All of this will inform the final reporting phase and most importantly, allow us to engage positively with the supermarket sector so our insights can shape community programmes going forward. We also hope that we will offer insights to inform collaborative efforts across business, local government and the third sector, as well as informing other business sectors about how they can support local community wellbeing through a range of activities. Now, we're going to move on to look at the specifics of the research and the things we've done to give us insights into the research question. The initial research analysed the CSR initiatives of the 11 supermarkets, which account for 96% of the UK's grocery market share. CSR activity was well embedded in all supermarket operations and three main themes emerged. The environment, focusing on the supermarket's operations and products, their people, staff and suppliers, and then the local community, i.e. the focus of this research. We examined information available on websites and documents of all types produced by the supermarkets broadly in the 2020 reporting period. We recorded details of any action or initiative described as a stand of their community strategy and identified 172 individual initiatives. These were roughly split 50-50 between pre-pandemic, that is their normal operations, and those which were responding to the new context presented by the pandemic. Of course, we've continued to track the CSR initiatives since that time, but that information hasn't informed the typology. Turning now to look at the categories of support that we identified. The most frequently mentioned was, unsurprisingly, supporting food banks. 
as all supermarkets aim to assist on issues of food insecurity and poverty and reduce food waste through redistribution schemes. This is a complex area where supermarkets often work with national partners such as Fair Share or the Trussell Trust, but we were interested in those local initiatives where food, whether donated by customers at the front of store or sourced from the supermarket's own back of store donations, was directly distributed to community groups. A central pillar in the majority of retailers' community CSR is fundraising for charitable good causes, although the attention is generally on national campaigns. However, we were more interested in the local level. So fundraising for good causes focuses on how they support raising the profile of small local charities and allowing them to fundraise direct from customers. For example, spots of bag packing at Christmas or stands in store with appeals for volunteers. This next category is money or grants for local groups was about donating money directly to community groups of all kinds. There were a couple of main ways that happened. First, four supermarkets run a token scheme where communities nominate and vote for local causes in store, the number of votes determining the amount of money received, usually a few hundred pounds in each case. Second, five supermarkets have charitable foundations where grants are distributed for local causes. These can be more substantial than the token amounts, anything up to say £20,000. Turning now to donations of goods, these can include raffle prizes or perhaps donations of biscuits for local events, stationery for schools or youth groups, that sort of thing. And these small items can often be highly valued by local community groups. The next type of support is commonly uh, its community colleagues' time. This includes their efforts to develop and support local networks, as well as volunteering to help out in various ways in the community. Finally, there is the store itself as an asset and how the space, both inside and outside the store, can be used for the benefit of the local area. Examples might include a knit and natter group using a meeting room or a talking shop initiative being run in a store cafe where agencies come together to sign posts to help they can provide with the aim of connecting people and preventing issues escalating. Or a local mobile health screening unit setting up in a car park. Okay, so once we've created the typology framework, we then turn to the case study activity. This map shows the five case study locations, four of which formed the sites for the main case studies and were visited between October 2021 and July this year. Before we started identifying the sites for the case studies, we created 10 portraits of the possible locations, so we had a clear framework for statistics and of statistics and broader information to inform decision making. You can see that the chosen places are spread widely across the country and all of them have neighbourhoods ranked in the bottom decile of indices and multiple deprivation. But apart from this, the nature of the places and the supermarket locations were quite varied. Leeds and Warrington were the first two places that we visited towards the end of the pandemic lockdowns. In Leeds, a city of 800,000, we visited a large standalone store serving the deprived neighbourhoods to the east of the city centre. In Warrington, a town of about 200,000, the store was in the town centre with a cafe and a small peripheral shopping centre. Then in June this year, we ran a case study in Wisbeach, a town of 34,000 in the Fens north of Cambridge. This took quite a long time to arrange as we were unable to base ourselves in a particular store because of the churn of community colleagues. That delayed things and in the end we identified participants with the help of Cambridge's local authorities Think Communities team who support grassroots community development and engagement. Finally, most recently, we were able to go to Blantyre, a community of about 17,000 within the urban area south of Glasgow. This visit was much delayed because the impact of the different waves of COVID affecting Scotland in a different way to uh, different times to England. The store with its cafe is essentially the main retailer of Lantar, apart from a small parade of shops. Here are a few numbers to show you the high levels of engagement we achieved. At each case study location, we brought together both groups of beneficiaries, that is those people who have received help from supermarkets, as well as representatives of organisations that we broadly identified as acting in a connector type role, whether they were community colleagues from supermarkets in the area, 
or representatives of local authorities or the voluntary and community sector or other organisations who work to bring communities together. The workshops followed the same pattern, with each group being asked to think about their particular communities, focusing on three aspects which impact on well-being and community resilience. That is relationships and participation, place and environment and people and economy. For each of these three vast areas, we asked them to score how well they thought their place did. They had a choice of red, amber and green, and you can see them holding up the cards in the photos here. And this sparked lively debate about what that judgment meant. Next, we talked about the different types of support offered by the supermarkets using the typology and how these activities make a difference to both local organisations and the community. We asked them to show us what support they'd received from supermarkets by using tokens to vote on each type. And then they were asked which one of the categories the supermarkets should focus their efforts on in the future. We also discussed how the support they received from supermarkets made a difference and specifically what impact the activities made to community well-being and resilience and how did they know. We also gathered the customer voice by running the token voting exercise with customers in Leeds and Warrington to see where they thought supermarkets should focus their efforts. And in Warrington, we also involved the regular friendship group who met weekly in the cafe and discuss with them their community and the differences supermarkets can make. Following the case study visits to the area, we carried out discussions with local stakeholders with a strategic perspective, i.e. local council officers and networking organisations, to fill in any gaps and to understand how supermarket supports really fits the wider network of civil society and local authority action in the area. Through developing an understanding of multiple perspectives, combining actions on the ground and an awareness of the supermarket and other support in the area, we were able to build up a picture of how community resilience can be shaped by particular initiatives. I hand you back now to Caroline so she can talk about how the peer research formed part of the data collection. Thanks, Catherine. <clears throat> So yes, the final element was the um, peer or community research project, which was undertaken with groups in Leeds and Wisbeach. It was really vital to us um, that the study captured the perspective of local residents, not just re representatives of local residents, not only on what it's like to live in the area, but also what well-being concerns they have, what they knew about supermarkets and store efforts towards local communities, the value that they attached to those actions, and whether they believe that there's more that they could do or could do differently. So we asked our colleagues at, at Leeds Beckett University Department of Health and Community Studies to lead community research projects linked to this work in two of the case study areas, Hare Hills in Leeds and Wisbeach in Cambridgeshire. Eleven community researchers across the two localities were recruited, trained and supported to answer their chosen research questions about well-being in the local area to collect and to analyse their data and to produce a report of their findings. In one locality, two of the researchers were also staff employed in a, in a supermarket community colleague role, which was something we wanted to encourage to help bridge the gap from findings to application, as well as to support a longer term relationship between stores and the community. And here on the left and the right are the front pages from the two reports that the community researchers produced. And in the middle is an image of one of the groups in their first training session. In both cases, the projects reported on the strengths and the challenges of their area, mirroring the approach to the case studies, and the local priorities were identified by local residents interviewed or surveyed by the community researchers. And they also reported on the level of awareness among most local residents of current supermarket supports in the local area. They made recommendations for different stakeholders including local authorities and the police in one area regarding future actions and specific recommendations were, were made for supermarkets to consider. So just a couple of quotes to illustrate firstly the concerns and secondly where supermarkets could play a role. In one area re residents had a very low awareness of where they could go to help uh, for help with their concerns about their area particularly in terms of complaints around littering, safety and crime. 
They also wanted support to know how they could offer their own help to, to as a volunteer or to make a difference in their community. So through uncovering the regularity with which residents visited the local supermarkets, they shone light on the potential of stores as everyday spaces to advertise and share information, as well as report back on actions taken to improve the neighbourhood. And this latter aspect was really important in demonstrating the community that they are being listened to, valued, as well as contributing to pride of place and community spirit. And community researchers discovered that there was currently a likely undervaluing of the potential of community information boards in stores, for example, and there was potential to do something around that. In the other location, shared concerns were highlighted about a lack of youth um, facilities, leisure opportunities, and a breakdown of social connections and community cohesion. There was a low awareness of what supermarkets can offer by means of support, which is reflected in requests for things that actually commonly feature in existing community actions, such as donations of goods and support to local events. There was also a clear ask for something that we would also highlight from the wider study, as something likely to enhance the impact of store actions and this was for supermarket community colleagues to buddy up with equivalent connectors in the community, perhaps working for the statutory sector or, or the third sector. So we'd like to thank Susan, Luth, Ruth and Louise at Leeds Beckett University. And most importantly, the community researchers in both locations who did an absolutely fantastic job and effectively highlighted the challenge that there is to implement national community engagement strategies from supermarkets at the local level in a way that's sufficiently robust as well as flexible to respond to local issues. So that thought on how strategies which are to, lar to a large degree standardised can respond to local needs takes us neatly into the so what question. How do we deal with the rich detail and complexity that we've uncovered looking through these case studies? How do we make sense of the myriad context, varied activities and varied challenges? Well, throughout the research, we've been informed by a theory of change approach, which we're testing through our discussions with the community. This is the theory of change that we've developed from um, out of one that was put forward by the What Works Wellbeing Centre. And this gives us a framework for understanding and valuing community oriented actions undertaken by food retailers in terms of their potential contribution to wellbeing and reducing inequalities. And this circular and cyclical representation helps us to explore to what extent do or could those supermarkets or similarly anchored local businesses intervene in ways that could improve the community conditions seen as influential on community well-being, potentially building longer term resistant resilience to future stresses such as cuts in public services, public health emergencies, or um, extreme increases in the cost of living. So whilst this is helpful, it is high level. Um, so to put some meat back on the bones, we're pulling out several pathways, exploring the inputs um, in terms of the supermarket initiatives and actions and the mechanisms of change by which these seem to make a difference in their local communities, according to the data we've collected. And we're validating these with those who took part in the research Firstly, store community colleagues from ASDA in the co-op, and then with wider stakeholders in some of the case study areas. And the three main pathways that we're drawing out for this piece of work is around community colleagues and how they use how they use their time. Secondly, access to other resources, so money, goods, donations, funding, publicity. And thirdly, the space within and outside of a store. So obviously it's, it's important for business to demonstrate the value of their actions in this area, both to internal and external stakeholders. And we see this theoretical un underpinning as providing several functions to that end. One is supporting strategy and investments. Secondly, as a tool to guide collaborative conversations with other stakeholders in an area. And thirdly, as a way of monitoring and identifying the value of contributions. Um, for example, towards those um, UN Sustainable Development Goals, or in alignment with the UK TOMS, which is the current standard UK framework for, for reporting social value. Just to give an illustration of how we're using this and breaking it down a bit, 
for example, if we're thinking about local community and voluntary sector capacity as an important condition for supporting community well-being, we can hypothesize how individuals with a key role in communities, such as community champions, called community colleagues, might make a difference to settings over time. Sometimes we break these down into what we call context mechanism and outcome configurations, which is what essentially this is here, which link features of local context, lo local context like unstable funding or a low awareness of support available to the specific activities designed to bring about change. We can also make it a hypothesis, verbalize a hypothesis, adopting an if then because structure. Thus, if supermarket staff have the time to find out about and network with community organizations, then the voluntary sector infrastructure can be better supported because community colleagues will understand local needs better and voluntary and community groups will be more aware of what support is available. So if we break down actions like this, we can define and assess the growth in capacity over time, identifying intermediate outcomes, such as raising awareness of available assets, facilitating events to connect previously unconnected community groups and to highlight funding opportunities. And I just wanted to pull out three quotes which illustrate the process of community colleagues working with their communities and groups and what it was that they highlighted as making a difference. So, for example, one person observed the speed and the depth of growth in knowledge and awareness, both their own knowledge and that of community groups on what they were able to offer. Another reflected on the power of connections in building capacity in the community with informal groups becoming key supports to others in, in a community as a result of the intermediary role of the supermarket um, community colleague. Related to this was the impact of facilitating links or referrals and convening different groups together. As another community colleague reflected on, actually following a meeting set out, set up but from our field work. Finally, this phrase, rang true amongst community colleagues from different stores and different organizations even though there were differences in the way that they work be a connector of people not a collector of people and so we're using the theoretical underpinning and the hypothesized pathways when we analyze these narratives of community colleagues and the wider stakeholders we've consulted with over the course of the study i'm just going to hand it back up to catherine now Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, we thought it would be good to bring to life some of what we found out by briefly outlining two examples from the case studies. You'll hear time, resources and developing connections being highlighted. The first vignette I thought I'd share is one of our community champion stars. This is a story of her realisation that being strategic is important in decision making and the impact that she has had over time supporting individual groups. She joined the supermarket part time whilst at uni in 2015 and became a champion a year later once she'd finished her degree. In this quote, she explains that for the first two years of being a champion, she understood her role. She undertook her role rather in a transactional way, but by 2019, she recognised that there was something missing and she began to look at ways to work more strategically, identifying need and linking in with organisations who are working to meet that need, bringing different sectors that support the community locally together. She talks about fairness as well as using her toolbox of support, which she mentioned included giving financial support, hosting groups in store, raising awareness of local good causes and driving actions for better lives, like going into schools to run healthy eating sessions. One of the metrics that she shared with us was the number of groups funded, as shown in this graph, and you can see that they grew steadily over time, indicating her impact in terms of reach. Caroline and I were delighted to hear recently that she's just accepted a job to work at head office in the foundations team where we're sure that she'll bring her thoughtful approach and grassroots knowledge um, to the benefit of all. Turning now to another inspiring champion, she began working at the supermarket in the place where she lives when she left school 20 years ago and was made a champion two years ago. She talked movingly about the needs of her community, 
whether that was the loneliness of old people, the mental health struggles of those with problems with drugs and alcohol, or the poverty which was particularly visible for her amongst school-aged children. She definitely felt that being grounded in the community all her life gave her a strong insight into how she could make a difference. She valued what she called her amazing community, which made her job easy. However, if you look at the two pie charts here, her impact is clear to see. The one on the left is a summary from all the case study token votes across the country, where support has been received. So roughly showing that that has been roughly across all categories. Then look at the other chart, which is the local vote on what they would like to see more of in the future in that place. And it's dramatically different and shows an overwhelming support of the role of the community champion. Typically modest, and you can see her quote here about the ripple effect. She made the point that it's not just one person in the role of community colleague, it's the whole stall, and every colleague has a role to play in supporting the community agenda. I was particularly struck by how important this could be when I talked to the general store manager who'd been asked by the champion to go with her to visit a local youth project literally across the car park from the store. He was impressed by what he saw and asked how he could help. They said that what would make the biggest difference to their youngsters was giving the parents jobs. So now when they hold a recruitment drive, the parents are supported in filling in the application forms and given access to computers so that they can apply. So just one example of where the community champion people-focused approach has had a significant impact. I'd like to finish up by showing you this quote from a local charity CEO who attended the group discussion in store. She pointed out how the community champion has also shifted negative perceptions about the store in the two, in the two years that she's been in post. A win-win in this case for both the community and the business. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine, again. Um, and just to sort of really start summing up, the, the final research stage um, involves validating those pathways to impact with wider stakeholders. And we'll be doing that via workshops in one of, uh, at least one of the, the case study areas, firstly presenting our findings to cross-sectoral stakeholders in Leeds. So we'll consider the sphere of influence in those workshops of the supermarket community actions. Is essentially a sort of a map around the system's influences over well-being. Um, so where they currently interact with other services, priorities and influences locally on well-being. And we'll be inviting reflections on their relative effectiveness, the perceived value of the outcomes identified um, to different stakeholders, and consider areas for potential development and collaboration to take forward on action on, on some of the concerns and, and priorities identified by the stakeholders in the case studies and or the community researchers in their work. We'd also like to hold, as, as um, Catherine mentioned earlier, some roundtable discussions at a national level with corporate and policy leaders. I just wanted to highlight um, quickly some of the influence the research itself is having. Um, and despite us still being in the midst of lots of analysis that we still have to do, and ahead of the final reporting. We've already seen some impact from both the emergent findings as well as the process and methodology that we've employed. So for example, the methods that we've adopted in the case studies and the peer research have already provoked new networking and connections leading to action. So the image on the left there, the images on the left show the results of a new partnership developed around school uniform, school uniform donations um, in response to the cost of living um, crisis and that was brought, around, brought about by a fieldwork discussion that we, we put together for the research. Um, the research has also gained traction in the industry with a recent article in the Grocer Special Goodness um, Edition. And in terms of influence on corporate strategy, um, ASRA have highlighted the influence of our research on aspects of their community programmes, specifically the spaces and places pillar of activity. We've also had some engagement with development of wider policy on place-based working and inequalities, contributing a case study for the consultation on the health disparities white paper for business for health. And we've shared a draft of our forthcoming working paper here with colleagues at the Department for Health and Social Care. 
Finally, we're considering how, how to apply this learning about anchor positioning and place-based strategies across other business sectors in our own local community in Cambridge. Obviously, Cambridge is widely reported to be the most unequal city in the UK, and we want to use this work with CISL and the central Cambridge positioning of our new Entopia building to find ways to support co-production and cross-sectoral movements for improvement to com community well-being within the city. Finally, here's our contact details if you want to get in touch with us. And I really would encourage if you want to have some more discussion on, on the research or um, talk to us a bit more about the findings. And um, we're really keen and um, want to have those discussions widely. Um, and as well as some reference to the fellowship publications where you can read a little bit more about the academic thinking around the study um, and the forthcoming um, working paper, CISL working paper that Catherine mentioned earlier. Um, so we'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for listening to us um, so far. And um, we're happy to um, answer some questions and have some further discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Catherine. That was absolutely wonderful. I mean, the work you've been doing is fascinating and fantastic. And I think particularly the last slides have like, shown and given a really great overview of the real life impact your work is already having. And also with a look forward. Um, Again, so we've already had some questions coming in for the, from the audience, so please do use the, either the chat function or the comment function mm. on LinkedIn and go to to submit any questions you might have. Just to kick us off a little bit, um, so Caroline, Catherine, like, so you've talked quite a lot about the rich history that supermarkets have in helping local communities, which a lot of it is focused on philanthropy. However, I think a lot of the things that you've described have been going above and beyond philanthropy. So like a two part question there. So sort of one side is like, why do you think supermarkets should go beyond philanthropy? And where are the limits of traditional philanthropy to help local communities? Thanks, Jana. Um, I think I, I think that Catherine might have something to say about that one. <laughs> Great, thanks. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, in terms of um, it, just think about corporate social responsibility, obviously, um, you know, we understand that there are things which um, businesses have to do, um, you know, they're statutorily required to or legally bound to. Um, and then there are, you know, society's expectations. But yes, our research has certainly focused on that discretionary, perhaps what used to be called philanthropic activity. Um, and it's an interesting one and i think perhaps one of those um vignettes that i talked about kind of highlights the importance of um you know what uh, the business can get out of it as well as what the community gets out of it um where the community champion genuinely um it had been quite a tricky place where um you know the the big store had seen a decline in um in the numbers of retailers in the town um, and just by being that open face and um, engaging with the community and showing that they really cared and they, they really could make a difference um, it turned around how people saw that store now bear in mind that place um, I, I think that the uh, supermarket itself was in fact the biggest employer um, and so, you know, you want to have that positive view of, of, a, of a business so that you can attract the best staff. Um, so it is kind of win-win. And I think that um, on the broader on the broader stage, obviously, investors um, are looking to see how uh, businesses um, operate and showing that they care about their local place um, is so important. And after all, we all have local supermarkets we all understand that we feel connected to those places and if the pandemic showed us um, anything it was that you know those were places that were open um, and where people felt that they could go and could meet people albeit in a socially distanced way um, you know that that really highlighted how important they are as, as anchors um, to the place. Thank you. And I think you make a lot of very important points there about sort of like the responsibility and also the potential that there is for supermarkets to kind of make that extra step to kind of like take on 
that mantle as an anchor con um, institution. However, kind of reflecting on sort of like that stepping up role, kind of like I think we've obviously talked about a lot about all the benefits that come with that. So the wonderful things a supermarket can do. But do either of you also, for example, see a certain element of risk in if actually a lot of what traditionally used to be public services are being taken up or offered by let's say big chains and so big supermarket chains like for example like for example Asda um if or do you actually see that normally was a remit of of, of public services should remain with public services so do you see a risk if actually supermarkets step up into that role or that void that has been created okay so i think um I think you're so you're the I think what your your question is getting at is the is are supermarkets stepping in to uh plug the gaps that are being left by public services stripping back their actions, I think is what you're talking about. Um I, I don't I don't think that I don't see that in this in the same way. I mean I th I think one of the one of the interesting potentials is is the the role of the, the supermarkets is that everyday space. I don't think it's it's replicating um, services that uh, that would otherwise be um, be funded or delivered through um, statutory bodies. Um, I think I think the the one of the most interesting potentials is is in terms of reaching people that are not in contact with services, and I think in, it, that sort of feeds into a in a prevention agenda to avoid sort of escalation of more, of, of more expensive um, service use later or later on down the line. I mean, the reality is at the same time that um, that the austerity has been affecting what's able to be delivered within um, statutory budgets for some time, and I think there's areas where um, where civil society and business has always had a bit of a role, um, and I think um, whereas perhaps in the past it might have been in more sort of paternalistic models like things with Roundtree and Bonneville and Saltair. Um, but actually, probably more importantly now, one of the interesting things would be how to deliver that in a more empowering way, engaging communities, which actually gives them a voice, um, which perhaps was not so much the more typical model. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that's that's all I have to say on that one. The other thing that I would say is that um, you know, talking about everyday spaces, is the um, we were um, given examples of where. Um, you know, a supermarket is a place without stigma for some people to go, um, so that where where they might feel awkward about going into um, a provision that was labelled in some way, um, that it, that is not the case it, uh, with a supermarket, and um, you know that is something that they can bring um, that's additional. So I think it's we're looking at those ways um, in which it generates more rather than necessarily looking yeah. to step into the breach, I guess. Mm. Yeah, it's absolutely, Catherine. And, and those the example that you gave on the talking shop um, there that, that we investigated through um, through this research, discovered some really innovative practice which had been set up between the community champion and social work team, um, really sort of exploiting the that everyday space and, and the lack of stigma um, and really um, already sort of um, narrative accounts of, of, of avoidance of, of harm uh, for for people in that community whether that's through um, debt and welfare crisis or whether it's domestic abuse so yeah so I think it's the, the that interesting space about where where you might be able to do something differently particularly around the prevention of agenda rather than um, plugging gaps so much and we also found so we also found um, groups um, that were working uh, with, um, you know, normal providers who said, well, if they knew, for example, that there was going to be a well-being um, session held at a, a cafe, that was excellent because they didn't have to look for a place, uh, make sure that it was, uh, you know, something that they could prescribe. They could just say, you know, this is being held, you should go. And it was open uh, to people. So, you know, there are lots of different nuances around that. So instead of sort of like more of a let's say the stepping up, plugging a get plugging a gap of replacing services, like so you you kind of like found the niche more sort of like the responsibility and opportunities more in the 
convening and empowering sort of the local community, like making their voices being heard and connecting them to the right services rather than replacing the services, which I think is an absolutely fantastic role to be in sort of that convening connector stage like, as a retailer with also physical presence in the local in the local community. I think like, that's so, absolutely, sorry, Caroline. Yeah. I was just going to add an extra before you just made me think about that then in terms of, um, one of the, the the additional study we did looking at more sort of at older adults and the potential for supermarkets to play a role with um, older adults in the community so i mean that that could be a role um there's certainly one of the things that we're hearing is sort of uh, an unmet need for for example lunch clubs um both sort of forming part, part of um performing a, uh, obviously <laughs> Of food, food provision, but also um, potentially of, of, of good nutrition for older adults. So that sort of food security, but also nutritional risk that might be might be there amongst older adults. But equally, um, stores with cafes um, potentially could be something that um, that would be very much in demand and, and could be an area of interest that, that would be um, would perhaps plug a plug a gap or at least do be some cost savings. There for um, for some strapped local authorities, so something to discuss. I think quite specifically in some areas. And we also we also found um, examples of where not only where there were cafes, but where um, the champions were able to go out and talk about nutrition and and provide um, in a kind of non-stigmatizing way again, kind of some food um, to um, people in need, so that they weren't seen to be going to a food bank, but they were there. To hear about how you could cook nutritional cheap meals and um, were distributed food at that point so that that was a different way and, uh, and the other thing of course which came through i think in every discussion we had is about how um, supermarkets and the colleagues there can help with loneliness um, and especially i guess with older adults you know that that is their time to go in and have social interaction um and that is that is happening every day across every supermarket i'm absolutely sure we did hear some very you know um heart-rending stories of where community champions had, or member pioneers had gone that extra mile um and really made a difference um you know there was a whole wealth of information there so you know that's another aspect which i think we need to kind of cherish and, and recognize no, I'm conscious that we're slowly running out of time, so I'd quite like to move into the next question, if that's all right. Like, I know this is absolutely fascinating, and we can mm -hmm. obviously talk about all the aspects like for a long time. But given that you've just mentioned sort of like the the food aspect, I think one of the questions that also came up was actually that it is wonderful, like all of the work that um, that supermarkets are doing. However, looking at the cooperating model, also like the products, for example, that are um, on sale, you know, you're still looking at enablers of sometimes toxic food environments by supermarkets still continuing to sell, food, for example, like alcohol, um, sugary foods, highly processed foods, junk foods in general. So like, how can you, so do you kind of see like a tension there between their, so sort of their ambitions, what they do for the local community, but then actually also the foods and products and actually the core business of what they sell? Sure, it's a good question and a, and one that's unavoidable. Unavoidable, sorry. Um, yeah, I think there is obviously a tension. Um, this this piece of research is very specifically focused on on the community focused actions by partly through capacity and what you can cover within a research study, um, but also pragmatically to to uh, through a uh, focus on well, these actions are happening anyway. So how can we make sure that um, they happen to the be make sure that they're happening to the best value um, that you can get um, out of them. But I think the systems um, lens that we also bring into the, the study is to uh, ensure that we don't lose sight of the um, the perhaps less positive side um, and commercial determinants of health um, that that are also um, inextricably linked to um, to supermarkets. But I sense, I guess, through what we've tried to do within this is to be focusing at least on the areas where there is value and, and try to understand what that value is. And if you talk about those areas, you can also at the same time acknowledge um, and bring shed, shed light on the other areas which are perhaps more harmful and where, where um, collaborations, uh, which we definitely would say would be one of the things that we'd like to see more of, 
um, locally, um, that those kind of conversations around what works well um, can also raise those conversations about what the issues are within those communities and actually quite a, quite a lot of actions which may be more on the business side um, of, of operations are actually undermining some of the, uh, the actions that are more positive. So I think, you know, with, with, with raising and, and um, being able to um, essentially champion what is working well and what's, what's of value, then it, it enables a platform to, di to discuss some of the aspects that are more difficult. Absolutely, I think that was that was a wonderful summer, summary of kind of like where there's still space for both, but also kind of raising that there are some hard questions that I think the this work has uncovered and still needs addressing addressing going forward. Like I say, I'm conscious of time, so like I'll close with one with one last question. Um, however, do please keep the questions coming. So like if we don't get to yours, um, we'll try to answer them afterwards. Or please also feel free to reach out to Caroline or Catherine directly with your question, and we'll try to pick them up as best as we can. Um, and I think so. Like one of the uh, one of the questions I quite like to close with is, of course, like what we what we've seen, what everyone, what all of us have seen in, by going into a supermarket is the rise of food prices. Um, like we are facing now an like, you know, energy crisis. So there's a general cost of living crisis, and I think there is a risk of compounding inequalities that were already compounded by COVID-19. So like supermarkets are struggling with their own cost prices, but so sort of like, in your view, given the recent cost of living crisis, where do you still see a place for supermarkets to continue their work? And what do you see sort of the future of this work given um, cost of living crisis? I mean, we have, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Go, you carry on. I was just going to okay, well, I'll be short. <laughs> I think there's, I think they have, they obviously have got a role. The, 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 the very point of, of the anchor positioning is that the supermarkets, customers, and staff come from the local area. So, you know, the cost of living is very real, and uh, it's very important to, um, for, for, for staff and customers to be able to, to address this. Um, and um, equally, in terms of, um, sorry, I've lost my track now. Catherine, come in. I'll come back. <laughs> just going to say that we, you know because we're tracking the CSR initiatives we have seen some different initiatives coming forward which are trying to look at more of the cost of living crisis but I think you know we should get some confidence by the agility that we saw um, through the actions of the supermarkets over the COVID-19 outbreak and um, actually that has pushed forward things and um, I think hopefully our study will help um, to really set this uh, strongly on the agendas of the supermarket so that they can see that putting um, effort and time and money into supporting the resilience and well-being of their communities uh, really will have an impact and a, and a beneficial impact. Thanks, Catherine. I'll come, I remembered what I was going to say now. Um, so, yeah, so effectively, I think, I think that's right. And I think what we, have, we did see in COVID um, was really positive. But I think what it also, to me, sort of flags a slight risk in that um, in those times of crisis, um, the actions do tend to sort of focus more on emergency help um, and basic needs, which is, of course, super important. But at the same time, there's a bit of a risk there that you may um, move away or the sort of preventative work becomes a little bit less prioritised. Um, and in terms of, sort of the building resilience to the future and being able to bounce back from some of these crises, I think the resilience work around creating connections in communities, ensuring that um, wages... Um, keep up with um, cost of living rises, then those are actually as important as, as the emergency um, support. So, you know, let's do both, please. <laughs> I think that was a wonderful like, finish and a good call to action. Let's do, let's do both, let's carry on that conversation. And thank you so much for taking the time to walking, walking all of us through your wonderful work. And I know you've been like, we've, you've been working hard on what you've been putting together and definitely the results were are worth it and very much looking forward to see what comes next out of your work and as Caroline mentioned which is also extended on the screen there is a working paper forthcoming from this work which should be published uh, published shortly where you can actually read more from supermarkets and their role in fostering community well-being thank you so much Catherine thank you Caroline and enjoy the rest of your day thank you all thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.